Off we go. Alison Morton, welcome. So good to have you here in Southern California today. Thank you so much. Well, it's um, hello from a quite chilly France. We are, are definitely going into the autumn. Yeah. Um, well, now, whereabouts in France are you, Alison? Well, it's the stock answer in the middle of nowhere. Um, <laughs> if you go put to Poitiers, which of course, mm -hmm. ancient medieval centre, we all know Poitiers yeah. from medieval fiction. Um, and we're a little bit about an hour northwest of there. Beautiful. And it's a very small town. Yes. And, it's good. And how long have you lived there? Uh, this time, it's, I think it's about 13 years now. Um, I was a student in France and partly spent part of my youth here and worked here. So it's not a foreign country. And I am a French citizen. Yeah. As well as British. <laughs> yes. It's nice to have that dual citizenship, isn't it? Mm. Have a bit of both. It's interesting, you know, we've been talking about immigration and emigration and a lot of the people in our group are first or second generation Americans. They've got, you know, ancestors and they, they're doing their family history, um, ancestors from Europe. So it's it's been a recurring topic of mm. what's it like to be living in a different country or growing up. Um, and it's been the theme of some of our, our work too. Mm. So did you, um, so let me ask you this, which is getting in the weeds a bit, but why not? <laughs> so I grew up in England, of course, um, mm -hmm. near Colchester, which is a Roman town. And it is. my brother uh, lived in St. Albans for many, many years, oh. which is another Roman town. You love to write about Roman history. Um, mm -hmm. Where was the influence? Was it the French Romans or was it the English Romans? Ah, <laughs> this goes back into my own ancient history right. when I was seven, and that was a long time ago. Yeah. <laughs> um, and my father was a Roman nut. And, of course, we, as kids for holidays, we used to get dragged around Roman sites. Yeah. I didn't resent it at all, but when I was about 11 and I was going from primary school to grammar school. So I was in that between period. So, And I was very nosy, basically. I wanted to know about everything. My mother was a teacher, so she encouraged thought and challenge and discussion. So there's this fabulous Roman site, and it goes on for miles. I mean, it's huge. Ex-Greek city, Romans took it over, expansion. And they had the most beautiful mosaic tiles. I mean, the floors were just exquisite, and there was room, and not bits, whole floors. So I said to him, well, who were the people who used to live here because the walls weren't there and the roofs weren't there? So my dad, he was very good. He said he put it at the right pitch for an 11 year old. And he said, well, about senators and soldiers and ships and traders and blah, blah, blah. Oh, right, OK. So I'm sitting there and it's really hot. Maybe my brain was boiling. And I said, yeah, but what do the mummies do? I mean, yeah, mummies and children. He said, oh, well, they stayed. The mummies stayed at home, looked after the children. And my mother was a head of a um, school department. Mm. <laughs> the women went out and worked. Even right. that, that was my normal. And I said, well, it must have been a bit boring. I said, well, suppose the mummies also ran things as soldiers and sailors and senators. And he said, he was very clever. I thought I'd give him full marks for this one. He said, well, what do you think it would have been like? Oh, right. <laughs> very clever. Lovely. And from then on, I have been over most of Roman Europe. If you see a really weird person at a Roman site, like the Colosseum or the Forum or anywhere in France, quite at the big things like Nîmes and all the rest of it, if you see somebody stroking concrete, that's me. <laughs> that's you. I love yes. Roman concrete because... Yeah. 2,000 hand, two, 2, years ago, hands touched that and made that. They did. And that is the history, that somebody else touched that and now I'm touching it. Yeah. And that, to me, is remarkable. It is. And that's so, where we get our inspiration. I mean, that's yes. that, that connecting, touching. I do the same. I When I go back to Lydia, the first thing I do when I, I walk into the house and I go and talk to all the portraits Hello, yes. how are you? Yeah. Sorry, I, I was rude to you in my last book. <laughs> so yes, Alison, I understand completely. So did you 
did you write as a child or did you start oh, writing? As a, I mean, we all wrote silly stories. Yes. 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 When did you first think about writing your series, which is extraordinary? Uh, yeah. Right. Well, I mean, I wrote school stuff like we all do. And yeah. I've been a career translator because uh, I um, am qualified to do French and German into English. Uh -huh. And I have built up a translation company. I've done PR stuff, I've done corporate documentation, I've done military reports because I was six years in uniform, but I'd never written creatively. I had a vivid imagination, which was all over the school reports. I right. wasn't much more attention. Right. Um, uh, but I went to a film, and I'm not going to say because I don't want to get sued, um, and I was sort of watching, it was filmed in Rome, and if I say it had Tom Hanks in it, and he's a very good actor, Right. A little bit of a speculative idea. So you're probably on the same thing I'm on, as me. I'm, I'm on track. <laughs> you're on track. It's not the first one. It's one he did before. And the filming was gorgeous. I mean, Ron Howard's photography is fantastic. Yes. And I had read the book, but the, the, the continuity was awful and the dialogue was all hacked up. And I thought, if I didn't know what was going on, I wouldn't know what was going on, which is such a shame. And I turned around to my husband and I said, do you know, I could do better than this. <laughs> so, of course, he said, well, why don't you? Right, right. And all this stuff. I went home, looked at my computer, and all this stuff poured out. There's Roman. I wanted a female leading the story. I had had those six years in uniform. I knew how that worked. But I had to bring my my woman protagonist up to the 21st century because a woman couldn't lead in a Roman, even right. late Roman environment. They had a certain amount of, uh, they had citizenship and they could own property and run businesses, but not, they couldn't be somebody who went out and saved the world. So I thought, right, okay, that's a conundrum. Then I read Robert Harris's Fatherland mm. where he put an alternative slant on German history because did German interested in Germany and I thought you can fiddle around with history I didn't know you could change the historical timeline right right I can have Roman women in the 21st century in a thriller but of course I had to build the whole world not a problem I knew Roman if you like, values, ideas, systems, names. I knew all that stuff anyway. Okay, you know, you have to still research. Right. And this just poured out of me. And it must have been bubbling away for hmm, four decades, five decades. Yes. yes. And in 90 days, I had 90,000 words. And I didn't have a clue what to do with it. Right. And a friend of mine who she was... Um, had built up and ran an estate agent, so a realtors, and she had five branches and she was doing really, really well, both in the Chamber of Commerce. Anyway, we used to go to the same events and we used to share the car because one of us could drink and one of us couldn't then. So I said, are you going to the meeting? I'll drive if you want. And she says, oh, no, I'm actually going to Hamburg. Oh, Right. I said, are you going to start selling property in Germany? No, no, no. She was very cagey. And she was a very forward businesswoman, tough lady. I said, oh, okay, well, so what's it about? Well, I'm um, doing some research, you know. I said, yes. She says, I'm writing a book. <laughs> what do you mean you're writing a book? I said, what, how to buy and sell property? No, um, <clears throat> it's a novel. <laughs> a novel you and she said well no okay look I know it's not me but here we go I said well actually funnily enough Denise I've just written a novel oh she said right great let's get at this together so we educated ourselves in the book world agents publishing we went to conferences we did class we did three years of this right. and script assessments and we really educated ourselves. And that's when things all start and the great self-publishing revolution was in full swing. Yes. And although there was a very big London agent, uh, Carol Blake from Blake Friedman, which she is was the agent's agent, 
she was my friend. She became my friend. And I said, I'm not going to send it to you, Carol. I don't think this is your stuff. So I, I self-published. Right. And it was great. And yeah. I thought, I've got too much story. I need to write another book to just to finish just to finish this off. Mm. Well, I wonder what happened to her a few years later, my heroine. What? So I had to do another book. Yeah. So I had four books on one heroine, Karina. And, but while I was writing it, a secondary character, her grandmother, who's the wise person in the background, she got up to some very strange things in her youth and she had loads of buried secrets. So I thought, I'll just write one more book just to do Aurelia's life as a young woman. So let's, so we're back in the late 60s and early 80s. And then it went on from there. So three more books with Aurelia. And then the fans said, yeah, yeah, we like your books. This is great. Terrific adventure, woman leading it. She has her up and down emotional life. This is great, fantastic. So what's the origin story then? Um, yeah, well, it's back in the fourth century. We don't have to worry about that. No, actually, we want you to write it. But I don't, I have no, 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 I'm not going to write it. Yes, you are. You will sit at your computer and you will write it, please. So I did. And out came Julia Prima, which is right. in the fourth century. Absolutely straight historical fiction. I thought, my God, what have I done? You know, this is terrible. But I had too much story again. Yeah. So I had to write enough. <laughs> so that comes out in January, um, which is very tied to the collection of short stories both you and I are involved in. That's right. I, a little sort of side scene to that book. But it's quite interesting writing at a time when the Roman Empire is on its downward path. Yes. It didn't all fall in one day, as in the film with Sophie Loren. Sorry, it didn't do that. But it fragmented. And by this time, you can see where the very early medieval city-state is coming. So it's a very interesting time to, in, to research incredibly frustrating because people stop writing stuff right, right. your historical documents pff, vanish disappeared. yeah yeah so you you really have to track down the few people who are still recording at that time but it so does they, give you a little bit of uh leeway in your in your fictionalization you can at least i mean if you can mm -hmm. there's a point where you research and research and then you go okay i cannot find anything more on this I'm going for it, not necessarily creating massive fiction, but, you know, there's perhaps a few liberties that you can take. Well, yes, I, I did a master's in history, which helps. Mm -hmm. So, you know, when you research a fact, you have to have three sources for it. Right. So then if you've always been interested in history and you read around it enough and you studied it enough, there are certain trends that happen. And you can, I call it historical logic. Mm -hmm. And there are only certain ways things go. Exactly. So you have to try and think out how did this logically develop? Yeah. What could have happened? What could have happened? And build on that. You can't, I'm not a, um, what is it, the man in the high castle. I think that's a bit mad. That's a bit yeah. box of fox as far as I'm concerned. It's just too much. There was not enough um it was not an economically very viable, the Third Reich. It was terrible. They literally ran out of money. Um, so I don't think that scenario could have happened. So, But I've put a base in this next book so that Roma Nova could have happened. Right, yes. Whether it did or not, you know. <laughs> yeah, but that's that's the what ifs, could ifs. And when you write series and when you, when you, mm. well, you intentionally always do that, but... Um, you do try to sort of put those little signposts in, which allow mm. you to develop a story. Yeah, um, I mean, you with yours, you don't know what people said in the tower to the princes. You haven't got a. There was no video recorder at the time. Nothing, nothing, and and or or it was all made up by Sir Thomas More, you yeah. know, in Tudor time, which then becomes fact because well, it's close enough, isn't it? Well, no, actually, it wasn't. No, so. More. Um, but, but Alison, <laughs> lots to go on. Um, 
tell me the difference when you're writing short stories versus your novels. Mm -hmm. uh, and mm -hmm. you did kindly put some ideas into our handout, but um, yeah, very different, right? A lot of lot of we have to be very disciplined. <laughs> a great deal of difference. In fact, I. I'm a long form writer. I'll give you that. You know, I can't write a part. I've done two novellas in my series. And because I restricted them to certain characters, I managed only to get to 35 and 38,000. Apparently, that's quite long for a novella. Anyway, yeah. I can't keep it down. So, Helen Hollick, who is masterminding our historical stories of exile, yeah. she said, I'm doing one on 1066. Okay. And it's alternate history. You are the expert on inter on alternate history. Yeah, yeah. I said, but I don't do shorts. No, no, I do not do. Ah, yes, there it is. It's sorry, there. Ten sixty six. Yeah. Yep. Ten sixty six upside down. Like suppose ten sixty six, that massively iconic date. Suppose it had worked out differently. And I said, oh, that's quite interesting. I said, but. I don't know anything about Normans and the Norman world apart from general history. You know, everybody learns a little bit about medieval and so on. If you're at all interested in history, you know a bit, but you don't. So it's fun. OK, right, fine. I said, as long as I can have one of my Roman over characters. OK. And I said, I can't do 2000 words. I can't do a story in that. I'll give you 5000, she said. Oh, all right, then I'll do that. Oh, God, what have I done? What have I promised? But I did it. And I kept it down to one heroine, her sidekick, her lover, and William. Oh, plus a bad guy. Um, and I found it quite refreshing. I found it very disciplining. Yes. I had to do masses of research to make sure I got the Rouen, um, Normandy's capital, right at the time they were just on the point of building a stone key but when my heroine visits it's still get into a small boat and go to the shore so you have to make sure is that tower standing at that time right what has it been demolished by then yeah and you have to go back and what would a roman think about a norman town not a lot, I have to say, because yeah. she's thinking. Not very hey, impressed, right? My ancestors built Rome and the whole world, and this is supposed to be an amazing town. <laughs> so you've got your character. You can bring your character in with attitude. Anyway, I did that. And Helen said, yeah, great, fantastic. We love it. And it did very, very well. 1066 upside down did really well. So I thought. You know, I'll have a go at writing my own short stories. So I wrote a collection of my own and practiced that way. They were all over the place, but it was really, really good exercise. It makes you not have a massive cast of characters like I do in my long books. And it makes you concentrate on one theme. But don't let anybody make a mistake that it's easy. Right. Because it's not. You have only... 1500 2000 5000 whatever the words are to get a whole story across and give a bit of character and a bit of setting so you have to really focus down on that particular thing and keep your style very very tight yeah yeah whether you then take it and develop it into a book like some people i know have done <laughs> like me and me <laughs> yeah but it does mean we get this chance to work with other people like you. I've worked with you on various projects. Yeah. And it means you do something different and it makes you work differently, which is never a bad thing. Yeah. Oh, um, it does. And I think the thing that's um, that I found enjoyable, you know, is that opportunity to perhaps explore an area of history or an area of a topic that you're not familiar with. Yes. And you're not yes. overwhelmed with thinking I've got to research a whole novel. No, mm. it's, it's just a vignette. It can just be a particular day in, in the life of, yeah. or be a particular idea. incident. Yeah. Um, and I think, you know, encouraging my readers and writers in this group to, who are researching family history or writing nonfiction, mm. you know, don't get overwhelmed when you can concentrate on an essay, a short story, yeah. 
a different way of or even a descriptive paragraph or two about something that you're researching just right right just for the joy of it for getting the words on paper which is the there hardest is a, thing though. yeah, yeah. I mean, yeah. I must admit, I when I was doing this, this so-called short story, when I'd done my research, I actually wrote up a result as if I was a stranger seeing this new landscape. And yes. I didn't put it in the story, but it was perfect because I got into the mindset. So exactly. just those few paragraphs was really, really yeah. good for me as a writer. Yeah, yeah I, I did the same, Alison, for, for my short story. I was in, you know, a different world. I mean, it was the same historical period, but character-wise, oh. um, mm. people that I'd never really met before. Um, mm. it, was, it was fascinating. Well, we're almost out of time. I can't believe oh. it. It's blown up. A <laughs> um, couple of things. And Alison, I always ask my writer friends here, what's what's your number one sort of in, in minute, uh, one minute or less, what, what would you recommend to people to, to encourage you to write, to, to get words on paper? What's your number one thing that, that keeps you going every day as far as writing? I think the thing is not to be afraid. The thing is to bash it out, to write it down. Yeah. Don't look at it as you're writing it. Just write the thing you want to, whether it's a description, a paragraph, a feeling, a little moment character a scene bit of dialogue just write it and then you can go back later because you might surprise yourself it might be really good yes if you stop oh that word's not quite right I think I need another word for that as you're going you lose your flow yeah so bash it I do this with my novels I do a hundred thousand words like that and even when I'm writing a letter or an email, and I try to keep it reasonably grammatical, I'm supposed to be a writer, I will just bash it out and then go back and after it's finished. Right. So don't let your flow be interrupted. Just go for it, literally. That's that's a great piece of advice because I think, you know, edit is 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 such a fall out of word to so many yeah. people. They're terrifying of editing, but it, there's a joy to it of honing. Oh, I love it. And polishing I love it. And yeah. Yes. So I think that's a great piece of advice. Just get mm -hmm. it on paper, right? Just do it. Yeah. <laughs> and you're almost done. Well, you've got yours out and done. I, I know a couple of weeks ago you were in that, I'm, I'm almost there mode. I finished typing. I've got to get this done. <laughs> So we can't yeah. wait to read the short story, um, which will be out by the time this broadcast. Yes. I'll, I'll be showing it um, in, in our Absolutely. workshop. And um, I know you'll let me know when your novel publishes, so I can tell everybody yeah. here the date for that um, and encourage everybody to go read the Roman Nova series because it's... It's been a brilliant. fun exercise. It's lovely all. And Helen has been a fantastic project leader. Yes. And... I just think we're going to have fun with launching it. I really do. I do too. I'm excited to to see what wow. happens. We'll be out in the world. <laughs> it's been lovely to talk. You too, Alison. Thank you so much. Say goodbye to Rancho Santa Fe. Bye, everybody. Good luck with your writing. <laughs> That's sweet. Thank you. And let me...